Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. It's 1090 Jake, man. I'm rocking with y'all. Let y'all rocking with me. For this video, I'm going to be speaking on the time I made somebody a knife. And after I gave that person that knife, everything took a turn for the worst. Now, this was 2015 at the Appalachian Correctional Institution. At the time, I was high custody. I was inside an I dorm, which is a high custody dorm. Everything is cells versus all the other dorms on the compound were open bay dorms. Now, I dorm is divided into four quads. You got I one, two, three, and four. The person that I'm going to be speaking on, who was a Zo Mafia family member, ZMF, this is the Zos, he was in I one. He was from Orlando. I met him on the rec yard. We would be working out. He would just be there. We didn't necessarily start talking and being friendly. I think we spoke because it was like a either a mutual friend or something like that. Somebody that he knew that I knew. Whatever, whatever. A conversation kicked off. I started to learn who he was. He learned who I was, etc. Now, Bloods and Zoes didn't have any pressure at ACI. We didn't have any problems. And usually the Bloods and the Zoes Having issues all stems from the JIT camps, the youth defender prisons. That's pretty much where it's all going down at and not necessarily just on a gang tip, but because two of the biggest powerhouses within the youth defender prisons is Bloods and Zoes along with Kings. And through having a constant fight for power, people are going to get hit up. It's going to create enemies. By the time I went to prison, we were already at war. Nothing happened that I was there for that caused it. When I got there, I was told who my enemy was, and that's just how it goes. Now, he had heard about me, and he heard I could make a knife. And a lot of people knew I could make a knife. Shout out to Bimba, my bunkie. I actually used to use his bottom bunk to shape the knives by grinding them off the concrete slab that was the bottom bunk. The top bunk was made out of metal. It came out, but the bottom one was a concrete slab that came out of the wall. And when you start running a piece of metal, what happens is you create a groove in the concrete. Once you create that groove and you break through the first layer of concrete, it's very rugged. And grinding the metal, you're able to shape it. I shaped Bimba's poker in there. We sharpened it up even more than it was. I mean, you could barely touch it and it would poke your finger. And I sharpened up multiple knives inside of this room. I also used to use my brother Rambo's cell. He was five top. So Rambo, cell one, two, three, and four faces the officer's station. Five on the top tier and the bottom tier is the first corner room. So it's like the duck off. This is usually the fight room. This is where you want to get tattooed. It's the furthest away from the officer's station. And Rambo... He was on the top tier, I'd go into his cell, and I'd use the bottom bunk to get it done. He slept on the bottom bunk, his bunkie was up top. His bunkie had an issue with it before, but he basically just let us do what it do. So this dude here is I know how to make a knife, and he reaches out to me. He tells me he's got a piece of metal. He asks me, what's up? Can you make this? Can you do this for me? Whatever, whatever. Now the big thing about making knives is you never want to make a knife or put a weapon into somebody's hands that may use that same weapon against you. I was not the highest rank in blood on that compound. So going off of rank, I stepped to my superior and I brought it to his attention. Shout out to Goo. Now Goo tells me, yeah, go ahead, run it. You know what I'm saying? He knew who it was for. He knew what it was. We didn't think it was going to be an issue, so he shoots me the piece of metal. And when I say shoot, I mean he sends it to me. He sends it through an orderly. The orderly slides the metal under the door. Now I have it. And it was this jagged brown. It looked like it was made, actually, out of a piece of bunk. I think they got it off of the roof or something. But it was just this jagged piece of, like, sheet metal. And now that I have this metal... I want to hurry up and bang out this knife. I want to do it quick because I don't want to be holding down someone else's shit. If I get this piece of metal knocked off before it's a knife, it still counts. And what I mean by that is if I get this shit knocked off, the CO comes and finds it, I owe this man a knife. I don't like owing anybody. I don't like anybody owing me. If I loan food to somebody, I don't loan it to them. I give it to them. You don't owe me. I don't want nothing back. Because if something happens and you fuck up, I know what I'm going to have to do. And that's the reason I really didn't give shit to anyone. Because I didn't want to be in that position to have my hand forced. It might not even 
be in your hands. I might give you food and then the CEO says some slick shit and takes you to the box for no reason, but now I'm out of my food. Now when you get out of confinement, you owe me money. Your first thought is, okay, let me hit for canteen and get right first. But my first thought is, you just did 30 days, it's been four weeks and I don't have my shit yet, I want it now. And that can start a huge issue. So I wanna get this knife done as fast as possible. I get right into the cell and I stop building this thing. I'm taking a lock and I'm beating the metal, shaping the knife how I want to shape it. I'm getting an idea on how I want the blade to meet. So the actual blade portion versus the back, which is more or less the stability. I didn't like to have my knives come like this. I like them to be more like a Tonto blade, I guess you could say. And I would try to get the sharpest angle. I never wanted it like this. I wanted one side flat up and one side meeting it, somewhat like a tattoo needle. So I get the knife right, it probably takes me, I don't know, the whole day to bang the thing out. I got it done the next day. I make the knife, he's in I1, I'm in I4, so I'm able to sign language and talk to him. We're texting on the window and I tell him at Chow, I'm gonna pass him the knife, and we're good. We go to Chow, we're sitting at two different tables, so I gotta wait because you know, we get assigned tables, not necessarily assigned, but the next seat open is the seat that you take. We don't have racially segregated seating at Chow. We don't have control really of like, you can just go to whatever table. If the next table is open, that CEO is gonna expect you to sit at that table. So people will generally line up with four people that they wanna eat with and you know that you're gonna sit and eat with your four. Or if someone you know, ends up getting put into your circle, they might swap out with somebody else and then you got sitting who you want at your table because People are very particular. You don't want people that burp. You don't want people that eat loud and sloppy. All of these things can cause problems. So I'm waiting. I got the knife on me. I see him. We're signing. I'm able to slide over to where he's at. He meets me halfway. I pass him the knife swift. Everyone, as far as the inmates goes, watch this whole thing. They watch me pull out the knife. They watch me hand it to him. They watch him put it up because I had it souped up. You know, I make the little drawstring with the sheet coming off. I take the ID tag. I put it on the end of the sheet so you can clip the ID tag right to your boxes and the knife hangs down. You're good to go because we got to get searched the second we come out of chow. Pass him the knife. I slide. He slides. We're good. We get back to the dorm. There's no issue until everything went south. Now, there was a blood from Miami named Curly. I don't know his real name. I've tried to look him up. He's missing an eye because he got shot in the face by the police. It blew his eye out. I don't know how much time Curly had. I just know that Curly was supposedly banging blood. And in no way did he affiliate with any of us. He didn't come to any of the meetings. He didn't go to church when we all went to church to run count to see how many homies we had on the compound. He wasn't in tune whatsoever. He was just like a 30-something, almost 40-year-old dude that felt like he didn't have to go by protocol, more or less. And he was really just rocking the banner. But he wasn't associating with us like that. He spoke to Goo a couple of times. He spoke to a murder homie that was in I3 that I personally didn't get along with. So me and him had, you know, zero communication. But I just personally didn't like him. And he's the same one that thought that I had become a king. Because when me and Bimba slid and ran down on the dude in the other dorm that owed some money, when we had to slide out with the uh, razor and the box cutter to the rec yard after that, Curly was the one that walked up to Bimba because Bimba from Miami, Curly's from Miami, the guy that we just ran down on, he was from Miami. So Curly walked up like, yo, what's up? Like people are telling me you ran down on him. Like, what are you trying to kill him or something? You got a hit on him. And Bimba was like, man, he owed me money. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't there for the conversation. I got put up on beat about it. I was standing a couple feet away watching the rest of the rec yard and at the same time watching Curly because if he moves stupid, me and Bimba are going to eat him up right here on the rec yard with no fucks given. So he had asked Bimba like, oh, he's a king? And Bimba's like, nah, fool, he a blood. And Curly ain't had shit to say about that and I really didn't like Curly to begin with. He's a big motherfucker. He's like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, he's not a small person. This is the same person that I asked Rambo you know, you want to slide with me on this one? And he was all for it. And I stepped to Goo and I asked Goo and Goo said, nah, I don't do it. Because Goo wanted to see me go home and I wanted to put something inside of Curly. I just didn't like him that much. I really had 
no respect for him. And something inside of me was just like, you know what? I want to just, it is what it is. But I'm going to respect the protocol at the end of the day. And I can understand through maturity the reason why Gu said that. Because Gu didn't want to see me set myself up for destruction. Go stab him. Something goes wrong. He dies. And now I'm in there for the next, I don't know, fucking 80 years. You know what I mean? So I disliked this dude a lot, you know, to the point that I wanted to do something about it. Other homies felt the same way. Like, all right, we just gonna, rah, it is what it is. Goo didn't want to do it. He didn't want to shake the compound at that time. Next thing you know, we find out and get word that Curly just got fired up in the chow hall. A little Haitian, little skinny, small Haitian pulled out a lock and a sock and fired Curly up in his head while he was eating his food. Now, I didn't know that, you know, he was Haitian. I didn't know that. Or if that was even the reason it happened, I'm guessing that was the reason it happened. But something with the Zoes, they sent the crash dummy. Buddy pulled out that lock and fired his ass up. And that right there created an issue. Even though we wanted to get him, he was got by someone else without our permission. And at the end of the day, if people are viewing him as a blood because he's been rocking that banner, even though we wanted to get him because he wasn't following protocol or doing anything with us, it still looks some type of way. It looked as if one of ours just got hit by the Zoes. So immediately we all strap up. And we know what time it is and we know this isn't going to be a sweet war because of the fact that that same Zoe that I gave that knife to is from Orlando. Orlando dudes that were at this compound were straight hitters. Some of them never getting out. Some of them multiple life sentences. Some of them multiple murder charges, beat murder charges, beat a murder on a cop. You just, you know that if it goes down, you really got to do it all the way. You got to be committed. You got to be committed basically to the kill because otherwise... You're going in there with the wrong mentality because they're coming to kill if they're coming. So we knew what it was. We knew if we touched that specific Zoe, who was, I believe, the head at the time, it's going to break out a war with the Zoes, Orlando, and the Bloods. And even though we was deep as shit on that compound, you know, shit can get crucial. It's going to get real, really fucking fast. But it's crazy how everything played out. Because right after that happened, something happened with the Zoes on the other side of the gate, either in Q or P dorm. And a few of them ended up going to confinement. Damn near all of them. I mean, there was only so many of them on the compound. I think it was like 10, maybe less than 10. But literally, almost all of them went to the box. And that's why I say, even though they didn't have the numbers, it still would have been us versus Orlando, who was very deep on that compound, rocking behind the Zoes just off the fact that he was from Orlando. So Curly's off the compound, most of the Zoes are off the compound, but this kid's still in R1, the same one that I gave the knife. And the only thing that's going through my head is if this breaks out and he stabs somebody, he's stabbing them with a knife that I made. And I took pride in my knives like it was fucking forged in fire. I used to tell people, you know, if I make a knife, you got to try not to kill someone with it. Because it's going to be a deadly fucking knife. I made big, crazy-looking shit. And I made good ones. And I didn't want one of my people to get hit with that. I would feel responsible. But at the same time, I had permission to do what I did. We didn't think that this would break out and this would happen. Now, the same Zoe that fired up Curly got put into the cell with one of our brothers. And I'm going to be honest. This brother, he was off. You know, he was off mentally. He seemed a little bit crazy. He had a life sentence. He had a fresh life sentence. He hadn't been down that long. And I think the realization was kicking in and mixing emotions in his head that caused him to lash out in a lot of different ways, you know. He was quick to sign up for something. If there was any hit on the compound, he wanted it. If anybody got green-lighted, he wanted it. Like, he just had a hunger and a thirst to build that reputation knowing that he has a life sentence. They fuck around, they put the little Haitian kid in the cell with him. We had an orderly that we were able to give canteen to who would bring canteen to confinement and pass it amongst our brothers, you know? So we had a kitty going, all the homies, if you hit, 
You put in a percentage of canteen, and that shit gets sent to the homies that's in the box. You know what I'm saying? So everybody's getting taken care of. They got some food. They got soap. They're hanging out. It's not as bad as being left back there in the dungeon without anything. And um, we get word through the orderly that the Haitian kid, you know, is in the room with our brother. So we sent the kite to him. And we got word back. And our brother that was in the cell with this kid beat the shit out of him. And I mean, when I say he beat the shit out of him, he literally made him shit all in the cell. He was jumping on top of his stomach, jumping on his head, just beating him into the fucking ground. Beating the shit out of him. There's no other way to describe it. He was cuffed up. I heard he was put inside of the shower. They had to bring a cleaning orderly in there to clean up. The blood and feces all inside of the cell. He beat this kid bad as shit. You know, he um, he fucked that kid up. It was a young kid too. And word came back, you know, to the Zoes. And I don't really think they cared because that was a crash dummy. You know what I'm saying? They sent him for a reason. They didn't send a hitter. Otherwise, they would have stabbed him with a knife. He just pulled out a little lock and a sock and bada bink. That's it. It's not that big of a deal. He got put in the cell with one of ours, got his shit rocked, and they hit somebody that we had planned on hitting. So from that point on, once we had the understanding that the one that did it got punished, everything died out. Gu made the decision amongst the rest of us that we're not going to pursue any form of violence with their organization. They didn't pursue any form of violence after the retaliation that happened in confinement. Everything died down. It was weird, though, because when we hit the rec yard, you know, dip buys, pull-up buys, push-up buys, I'm still working out around this kid. We didn't necessarily have bad blood. We still spoke. You know, he'd be like, what's up? I'd be like, what's up? We trying to get big. Oh, yeah, da-da-da. You know what I'm saying? Even though I was skinny as shit. But you could just feel it in the air. I'm talking to someone who understands we were about to be enemies. We were about to be not talking. It would have been on site. And it's very strange having a conversation with someone like that. Because you go from having all these thoughts, putting that anger and hate inside of you, boosting your own emotions up. When I see one of them, I'm getting them because I know they're going to get me. I got to do this. So now it's peace, it's called off. And you just maintain your posture, you maintain your level of calmness as you talk and entertain a conversation with somebody that was thinking of hurting you the same way you were thinking of hurting them. That's the reality of being inside of prison, of being locked in with people who become your enemies. Through circumstances in which you can't always control. And if you never want to feel that feeling of, I can't do anything about this. If you never want to feel that feeling or those thoughts processing inside of your head. That when these doors pop, that when we go to chow in the morning, I got to take off on one of them because they're going to be taken off on me. The thoughts of seeing people you consider brothers and close friends... Being stabbed, being killed, all of these thoughts, and all it takes is one direct order from whoever's above you for all hell to break fucking loose. And that's why I thank God I was blessed because I was with Goo. Goo was smart, Goo was calculated, Goo was tactical, Goo was militant. He did everything to keep us in a position of power, but to maintain peace at the same time. And that's why I always salute to him and give him credit for me coming home. Because of how much he sacrificed and put his neck out to make sure that I could come home. But hey, it's 1090J. I'm rocking with y'all and y'all rocking with me. Till next time.